BCS standings are out, and OU is still in the thick of the national title race. Next up, a road trip to Kansas State. Hello, and welcome to the latest edition of OU Football with Jake Trotter. From the Dodge Sports Desk, I'm Mike Kaler, and joining me, as always, is OU Football beat writer Jake Trotter. Jake, let's dive right into the national title race. OU is the highest-rated team with only one loss. In terms of positioning, I guess it doesn't get any better for the Sooners at this point. Yeah, not only not only that, the teams that are sort of in contention with Oklahoma, like from the SEC, like USC, all had really bad computer rankings, I thought. Uh, USC had a number 10 in the computers, and I think Georgia had the highest of the SEC teams at number three, uh, number 7. So uh, Oklahoma's in pretty good shape right now as, if they continue to win out. But Texas is still up there. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit about this whole thing that's getting kicked around now of those two playing each other in the big game. Well, it's not the likeliest of scenarios. They, that some things have to happen for that to work out. First of all, Penn State needs to lose at Ohio State this weekend, and then Alabama would probably need to lose to somebody, maybe at LSU the weekend after, uh, maybe even another game as well. But uh, if, if you have a one-loss SEC champ and uh, everybody in the Big Ten and the Pac-10 are done, then who do you have left? You have Texas at number one. You have Oklahoma, who's probably going to be number two in a lot of the human polls, probably going to be number two in the computer polls, too, because their wins are very good. They're going to have, have beaten TCU. Cincinnati is another team that only has one loss right now. Um, if they run the table, they will have beaten Oklahoma State and Texas Tech, who are both going to be you know, top 15 teams probably in the BCS by the end of the year. And their loss is going to be to the number one team. And as Richard Billingsley told me, if you're going to lose to someone, lose to the number one team as the computers go. <laughs> All right. Well, instead of projecting ahead, let's look back a little bit at last week. It looks like they're trying to take care of a couple of their problems, the first one being the running game. What did they do differently? Because it looked like DeMarco Murray was kind of back on track. Is, is that problem kind of getting taken care of? Well, obviously, I think the line blocked better, but the biggest difference between Texas and uh, Kansas was that DeMarco Murray, Chris Brown, and, and company, they ran harder. They made people miss one-on-one. -on -one. And I think for Murray this year, it's been more of a mental confidence thing than it has been a physical thing. So maybe this game gives him a jump start, a springboard for, for the rest of the year, and he can run with a little more confidence because before Kansas, he wasn't running with any. Maybe the most interesting move, though, was the move, this move from Nick, of Nick Harris from safety to Ryan Reynolds' spot at middle linebacker. It seemed like that worked out. Is that, is that the plan for the rest of the season? Is just to get him to stay there since he's such a good tackler and, and, and all that? Or, and does that solve that hole that's kind of in the middle? Yeah, barring injury to somebody at safety or just a total collapse at some point, uh, Nick Harris is going to be the middle linebacker this year. Uh, you look at the defense, and it's kind of interesting. They have basically seven defensive backs on the field now. If you count Travis Lewis as a DB, which I do in a lot of respects because he's really fast and he looks like a safety. Mm -hmm. um, so look who they play. They play Texas Tech. That's what you'd like to have. Uh, they play uh, uh, Oklahoma State. To some degree, that's what you'd like to have, although OSU runs the ball better. Mm -hmm. For some reason, they were fortunate enough to make the Big 12 championship. That's either Kansas or Missouri. You definitely want that. So it's a defense that I think matches the conference well for the rest of the year going forward. Uh, update us on, on Manuel Johnson. He uh, it looked pretty gruesome there when you mm -hmm. looked back and, and saw it on, on video. What's the diagnosis with him? Well, I don't, there's real no diagnosis at this point that, that I know of. I think they were they were looking at him yesterday, and we still hadn't hadn't heard the word yet. But uh, it's probably a dislocated elbow, which means might be out a week, might be out three weeks. I don't know. I think they'll have him back before Texas Tech, mm -hmm. which is really I think you look at this this three game stretch with uh, Kansas State on the road. It's terrible. Uh, Nebraska at home. Nebraska is not that good this year, and then Texas A&M on the road, and Texas A&M is dreadful. So mm -hmm. you think you'd be all right in those three games? You never know, but I think you'd rather have them for Texas Tech and Oklahoma State than risk hurting, uh, re-injuring it over this three-game stretch. Uh, talk a little bit about what Bradford did on Saturday. He breaks the, the single-game passing record that Josh Heupel had had. You know, even without his number one guy, he would show you that. I mean, targets he has there. Talk a little bit about It's, it's pretty incredible. You think of a quarterback losing his leading receiver and then breaks the school record for passing yards in a game. Quentin Chaney, I haven't even heard from him in, you know, since January of, of this year, <laughs> goes out and catches 105 yards receiving. Mm -hmm. Joaquin Iglesias has a career day. Uh, Broyles, Gresham, those guys all contribute. So um, they just have a lot of weapons. Bradford really does, is excellent, especially for a young quarterback, at not locking in on one guy. He'll throw it to any of those guys. He'll throw it to Tunnell. You remember uh, fourth down against Kansas. What are they doing? They're throwing the ball to Tunnell down the field. Now, he didn't make the play, but that mm -hmm. showed a lot of confidence in your 
what, six string receivers. So um, they just have a lot of weapons, and Bradford does a great job of spreading the ball around. Okay, going to, looking ahead to Saturday, Kansas State. This was a game where everybody kind of said this could be the trap game back when OU hadn't lost yet. Uh, is that still the case, or are they, are they kind of past that point? I don't know. I think, first of all, Kansas State's not very good. I mean, they lost to Colorado when Colorado was struggling. Uh, they beat A&M pretty bad, but uh, Kansas State just hasn't shown a lot this year. Um, however, going to Manhattan is never easy. OU found out in 2004 when the Sooners were undefeated, number two in the country, went to Manhattan, and uh, Texas a I think, had a losing record at that, at that point, and it really was a game that went into the fourth quarter. OU eventually won 31-21. But uh, it was a close game. You could see something similar happening here, but I don't think Kansas State has enough firepower to hang with Oklahoma. It's just a bad matchup for Kansas State. They don't protect the, uh, the quarterback very well, and they don't have a run game. <laughs> OU leads good. is, what, number two or three in the nation in sacks, and they have a terrible pass defense. Think about it. If you give up 450 yards plus passing to Texas A&M, mm-hmm. you're not a very good pass defense team. Imagine what Bradford's going to do. Man. All righty. Thanks, Jake. Be sure to follow all Jake's stories and the best coverage anywhere of OU football on newsok.com and every day in the Oklahoma.